Uh, thank you, Chair, and ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to represent Taiwan CDC in the next 30 minutes to share the public health perspective of enterovirus uh, surveillance and response in Taiwan. And start with my uh, my talk. Oh, okay, I see. So I would like to bring you back to 20 years ago to like telling you a story about what happened. I was actually in medical school, so I checked the new old newspaper to find out what happened. You have seen this in Professor Link's slide about the New England Journal data, and I don't want to remind you about the large number of cases, severe cases, and deaths. But I want to use the news, um, a journalist uh, uh, chronicle to remind you what happened on a weekly basis during that time. So in May two, uh, 1998, actually, uh, I think Dr. Ching Liu's team in uh, Chen Gong University in Tainan uh, raised uh, the alarm about uh, uh, circulation, increased circulation of enterovirus which is associated with uh, childhood, severe childhood diseases in southern Taiwan. And later on, also Professor Ling's team in Chang'an, uh, in northern Taiwan, also remind the government about what happened in uh, as an outbreak. The, during that time, the surveillance and detection, uh, preparedness, response was weak, and the government was heavily blamed for the delayed detection, delayed uh, uh, activation of uh, control response, and the lack of good coordination against this enterovirus outbreak. So that really set up where we are now because a lot of change of the system was made and I want to thank uh, most of the uh, professors here in this auditorium for raising that alarm and also uh, telling the government what to do and helping set up the future system after the 1998 outbreak. So after that outbreak, the legislative change will happen, which has greatly strengthened our surveillance systems and also emergency response, not only to enterovirus, but to other emerging infectious diseases in Taiwan as well. And in 1999, the enterovirus infection with severe complicated cases became notifiable disease in Taiwan, and the doctor has to report cases uh, within seven days of diagnosis. And in the real scenario here, usually we receive the report within 24 hours of the doctor's diagnosis. So it's good for us to understand real-time epidemic and also to uh, implement investigation and the necessary control response. And also the, uh, the lack of coordination plan during that time led to uh, integrated authorities. And in 1999, Taiwan CDC was actually born. During that, before that time, it's laboratory detection and investigation and the policy and the response was uh, scattered in different agencies in Ministry of Health. But during the outbreak, the lack of coordination resulted in uh, heavily criticism. So in the end, the legislative change and also authority change led to the four birth of Taiwan CDC, which are now in charge of all the positive, uh, necessary uh, enterovirus response and the surveillance, investigation, and policy in Taiwan. So this, uh, on the right hand side, you can see just another journalist uh, article about the, the gap in the disease control system because of uh, revealed by the enterovirus epidemic in 1998. So if you look at my abstract, I think it's on page 13, you'll see more details about the surveillance systems uh, of enterovirus in Taiwan. I won't go through all the details, but I want to highlight that we, also, we have multiple layers of the surveillance system to detect mild disease, severe disease, hospitalization, and also to detect outbreaks in facilities like postpartum care, child care, kindergarten, and schools, including the school absenteeism and the school, uh, class suspension uh, detention systems. And also we have outbreak surveillance among facilities. They are required to report suspected enterovirus clusters to us. And that's parallel with also uh, policy about the suspending class if there are more than two cases within seven days, the, uh, the, case, the case will lead to uh, closure of the class for seven days, uh, and uh, I'll talk more about that later. So uh, here is the more detailed description of the enterovirus severe complication surveillance definitions in Taiwan. So 
Basically, the first part is about old children. If the, uh, the case occurred in a child with herpangina or infant disease, accompanied by uh, neurologic or cardiac or hepatic complications, that would count for uh, definition of a suspect severe case. And in uh, also uh, infant, you see the third uh, part that is uh, for newborn neonatal sepsis syndrome without other explanation can also qualify for reporting as a suspect antivirus case. And usually reporting is uh, necessary for doctors to also submit specimens for antivirus testing because uh, the, the antivirus contract laboratory system in Taiwan is only a uh, system for testing uh, antivirus uh, officially in Taiwan. And the second part is added last year just because of the antivirus T68 outbreak, which I'll describe later on. So here you can see the, the four major surveillance systems in Taiwan, the findings displayed as open data on our website in Mandarin Chinese and also in English, and it's up updated on a real-time basis. On the uh, left upper hand, you can see it's the reporting of the severe cases, the red indicate laboratory confirmed cases. And the up, uh, right upper side, you'll see uh, surveillance of the emergency visits for antivirus. And on the left upper, uh, left lower part, you can see the surveillance for outpatient visits, uh, hand foot mouth disease or China. And also we have the viral sentinel surveillance to detect uh, virus from outpatients uh, with serpentina or uh, hand foot mouth disease. And that's also submitted from uh, more than 600 sentinel physicians on a weekly basis. So with this robust surveillance system, we are able to identify this activity change of endovirus on a weekly basis. And uh, throughout the years, we have found a pattern of seasonality of endovirus circulation in Taiwan. Generally, we expect to see increased endovirus in, uh, activity in spring and summer. And usually in the past uh, decade, we expect to see another increased activity peak after summer vacation finished when the school reopens again. But in the uh, very recent years, we have found a kind of change of the pattern a little bit that the peak, the second peak, can also appear in winter time, in November or December. We are not very sure why that happened, but it's just a change of seasonality that also causes us to be prepared for possible uh, enterovirus outbreaks in winter time, not only in spring and summer as well. So with the surveillance, we estimate the disease burden with these figures that uh, uh, 400,000 to 600,000 uh, visits are for enterovirus related disease every year. And uh, all throughout the, the, the past decade, we have uh, in total more than 2,000 severe cases and 200 deaths. And the EBA71 accounted for the vast majority of the severe cases and also deaths. And as the Professor Ling has highlighted, although we are still seeing some of the EB71 severe cases in the recent years, but the number has largely reduced we don't see uh, outbreak, large outbreaks in the recent uh, six or five years. And also the mortality rate has greatly reduced thanks to the, uh, the clinical team, their expertise in managing severe disease. So in summary, I just want to summarize the surveillance findings learned in Taiwan that usually in Taiwan we expect to see seasonal enterovirus outbreak beginning in late March and peak around mid-June. And usually we expect to see another smaller peak after school reopens in September. But there has been some change of recent uh, late start or late peak in winter time. And also uh, we expect to sometimes see the second peak in December as well. And um, uh, in the early 2000s, we usually say EB71 would circulate as, and cause a larger e epidemic every two to four years. But this trend has not been seen, uh, fortunately, after 2012. But we are still very prepared to, uh, to, to encounter a possible uh, A71 outbreak and uh, remind the public every year in the springtime that this 
probably going to be the case because the threshold hosts are still accumulating. And uh, the good lesson we have learned is although the A71 still accounted for most of the severe cases, mortality in Taiwan has greatly reduced in the past decade. But now we are seeing uh, more and more non-71 threats such as uh, EVD-68 and ECHO-11 virus, which I also described as a case, two case studies in Taiwan later on. So for D68, I think I want to highlight that uh, although we think antivirus would cause painful mouth disease and herpes vagina, in this day the story is totally different. We don't expect to see a lot of painful mouth disease or herpes vagina associated with D68. Usually we expect to see D68 based on the US experience with URI symptoms, upper respiratory symptoms, fever, coughing, sneezing, runny nose without the, the typical presentation of other enteroviruses. And also, uh, the association with acute flux in myelitis, abbreviated as AFN, was also uh, published uh, in the US, and we have found the similar phenomenon last year, which I'll describe. So before talking about the outbreak last year, I want to uh, describe the surveillance of AFP and uh, enterovirus D68 briefly in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has already eradicated polio. So after the polio eradication, we still have a long-standing surveillance system to detect any possible polio case by the AFP surveillance. So as the physicians, they, they have to report uh, AFP cases, um, and the reported case will be first determined clinically by uh, collaborating neurologists that CDC has confirmed or excluded. And also, we require laboratory submission of the stool specimens, and also a 60-day neurology follow-up uh, will be conducted by a public health investigation to collect data on the sequelae uh, of the, the, the case. Due to the EVD-68 concern raised by the U.S. outbreak in 2014, we started to add pharyngeal swabs uh, in 2015 to detect antivirus D6K because we know the yield rate of D6K in stool is not good, but it's more likely to detect EVD68 from the respiratory systems. So starting from July 2015, we started to uh, require submission of the respiratory uh, uh, specimens and also test the specimens for uh, EV uh, PCR and viral isolation. And uh, because of the the detection system established in 2015, we uh, started to detect uh, positive antiviral D68 sample starting in, in 2017, in August. The first EVD68 positive AFP was detected in August 2016, and also second case in August 2017. And after the second case, we uh, subsequently detected much more a uh, number of positive EVD68 AFP case. So in total, uh, 13 cases, 12 plus one, was detected in 2017 uh, from November to December, which was the clay B3. So the unexpected um, increase of AFP associated with D68 was illustrated in this uh, graph. If here you can see the neurologic confirmed uh, clinical AFP cases was generally at this level, but in, in last year, in uh, fall and the winter season, we have seen much more increased number of uh, the reports of confirmed AFP cases. And this chart shows the laboratory results of these AFP cases. So before uh, the fall season of 2017, we didn't see any positive EVD68, but uh, in just uh, November to December, we have seen much more positive cases of EVD-68 among those AFP cases. Not all were positive for EVD-68, but at least we see an increased uh, number of EVD-68 compared with our baseline. And here is the line list of all the 14 uh, cases throughout the two years uh, with positive EVD-68 PCR isolation found in a uh, child with uh, AFM or encephalitis. Here you can see they are mostly aged under year of five, uh, with female, males, and uh, 
mostly detected in November and December last year. Uh, and the level of MRI testing shows that uh, the various regions are from uh, central nervous system, from brain to spinal cord, some were pretty extensive, some were pretty localized, and all of these children are mostly presented with limb weakness or forelimb weakness, and sometimes they also present with uh, central nervous system uh, uh, symptoms. So because of the uh, LP detection, we looked back at our respiratory surveillance, and we didn't find a lot of uh, increased uh, antivirus D6CA reports from our uh, outpatient ARI surveillance. That's the discrepancy. And also, when we look at our severe pneumonia surveillance, we also didn't find a lot of positive EVD68 cases. So that's a discrepancy that in Taiwan, we only see increase of LP, not like in the US, you see parallel increase of respiratory and neurologic complications. Uh, and because the EVD68 didn't present with serpentina or head mouse disease, in order for physicians to report and to test, we added uh, another criteria of including uh, children with neurologic symptoms without serpentina or head mouse disease. And if the doctor was suspecting of enterovirus, they can still use this reporting criteria to report. That was effective uh, since December 2017. So after that, we are also seeing more and more reports. But fortunately, throughout this year, we haven't seen any new uh, antivirus D68 positive ARP case until now. So uh, that also kind of highlights the preparedness and the response. We are ready to fight against not only antivirus A71, but also emerging uh, other emerging antiviruses uh, in Taiwan. So well, I think in Taiwan we are very lucky, although the, two, the 1998 outbreak was unfortunate, but also that big outbreak with a lot of fatalities greatly increased the public awareness about the severity of mental virus. So for our overseas guests, if you go to the street and ask any citizens in Taiwan, they will tell you they have heard about mental virus, they have heard about influenza disease, and they know hand washing is very important to prevent enteroviruses. And also because of the SARS outbreak in 2003, that also led to a lot of the behavior change in Taiwan, not only in hospital infection control, but also in day-to-day -day health hygiene practice of Taiwan. So Taiwanese people like to wear masks. If you go to the metro, you'll see a lot of people wearing masks, not because of they are sick, just because they don't want to be transmitted with other people's viruses. But I think this behavior change led uh, by uh, previous outbreaks greatly facilitate the public health uh, practice implementation in Taiwan. So in order to prevent enterovirus spread in childcare systems, uh, for childcare givers and school staff, when the virus was not circulating much, for example in January, February, and March, we asked the school and the child to work with the Ministry of Education to, uh, to require the school staff and the caregivers to promote hand hygiene not only among the staff but also among the children. So if you have a chance to visit a kindergarten in Taiwan, you will see a lot of the children that are practicing how to wash hands properly with soap and water. And also in March and April, when the outbreak usually was not yet starting, we required public health professionals, local governments, to audit or inspect this kindergarten and the daycare system to, uh, to make sure the children are following the instructions of hand washing and also following the instructions of uh, sanitation uh, in disinfection uh, properly uh, in the school system. So external inspection has been a yearly practice and we also do that uh, off-season and in-season. For healthcare providers, before the outbreak uh, starts every year, we implement a lot of continual education courses associated uh, with the pediatric uh, society, you know, infectious disease society, to as this expert to teach new doctors about how to get warning signs from uh, the patients about uh, when to suspect the patient can get a severe complication 
based on some of the warning signs. And also for uh, medical centers and regional hospitals, they would also have teaching courses to educate new doctors on how to manage the real case properly based on the research findings from Taiwan. When the enterovirus season comes, we ask the child care givers and school staff to pay attention to symptoms of the child and report absence and also report outbreaks. And also the, the school staff and the child givers, they have to refer uh, suspect cases to uh, physicians in order for the physician to do uh, proper examination and testing. There is a strong enforcement of sick leave during the season. Uh, so when a child has been diagnosed with suspect enterovirus clinically or laboratory, uh, the, the child will not be able to attend the school or attend the class. They will be asked to stay home. And if there are more and more cases, for example, two cases within seven days, the class will be suspended in order for crowd reduction and not to spread to other uh, children. For healthcare providers, uh, the uh, physician, the primary care physician, they uh, are paying attention to warning signs of enterovirus disease and refer children with uh, warning signs to regional or uh, medical centers uh, for proper management. And we also have a network of uh, severe case management uh, in terms of responsible hospitals and a consultation network. A lot of the professors in these auditoriums are our uh, great asset of experts in managing uh, enterovirus severe disease. They would serve as consultant to teach those hospitals with, with less experience how to manage the children's care uh, properly and transfer the patient to uh, experience centers when necessary. Also, the infection control practice is very important to make sure endovirus does not spread in facilities and uh, hospitals. So here is a graph showing the warning signs, for example, a lethargy, uh, myoclonic germs, shortness of breath, tachycardia, and persistent vomiting. And the, the education of warning signs is on a weekly basis during the season. So for nearly all the press release we release, we would uh, educate the public about warning signs. The, the family has to, be pay, to pay attention to the warning signs. The uh, primary care physicians have to pay attention to warning signs. And I think that largely reduced the uh, uh, morbidity and the mortality associated with enterovirus, especially uh, 71. And here is a map showing the 75 uh, responsible hospitals for enterovirus severe disease. So in, throughout the country, we have a regional system to uh, to prepare the hospital for receiving enterovirus severe case and they receive proper training and they also have contracted the virology labs throughout the country to support testing uh, on a very quick basis. And when this all season, we also uh, expect the preparedness of this hospital to make sure their training is in place and their hospital staff is well informed about how to manage the severe case, and the consultation network also is in place. And it's important to always remind new parents about, well, the importance of staying away from enterovirus. So the risk communication, public education materials are vast. I think we are probably the, the, uh, the number one country in the world to educate about enterovirus. Uh, so many materials, new media, social media, and also posters and videos about how to uh, stay away from enterovirus, how to properly wash hands, and how to be careful about the warning signs. And if you go to childcare and school, you'll see children practicing hand washing. And uh, also, we have some uh, gaps to promote them from uh, re uh, not uh, forgetting the uh, the uh, 20 minute or 30 minute hand washing uh, steps. And also, uh, we have we send professionals to kindergarten and the childcare in the school to inspect their uh, uh, sanitation and disinfection procedures, like which kind of uh, concentration of the detergent to use, and also make sure they are doing the practice uh, properly. And because of the increased uh, public awareness, the enterovirus 
uh, control response is not only government, but also from the private sectors. Here you see the McDonald's. Every year they have this uh, uh, nationwide campaign of promoting hand washing. They work with uh, Taiwan CDC and the school systems and send a lot of the, uh, the uncle, the McDonald's uncle, to the schools to, to play with children, but also to teach them how to, uh, to remember uh, wash hands properly. And also here is a very popular uh, tiger, <laughs> favored by, uh, we call Chao Hu, favored uh, by children. And he is also a very popular comic star by children, and he also uh, is rep represent how to wash hands properly uh, and play with children. So we have a lot of private-public partnerships to support our antivirus response. And that's not uh, request, requested by the government. It's really from the initiative of the private sectors. Okay. So with that, I think you, you probably think it's perfect world in Taiwan to fight against antivirus. But uh, this year, we have encountered a different story. So in 2018, we have seen not many uh, antivirus outpatient or emergency department visits compared to 2017. 2018 is actually milder. But we are seeing a unique increased activity of a special antivirus called Echovirus from April to September. We have just finished outbreak recently, but hopefully you will not see another peak in winter. So what happened uh, in this year was, in 2017, we didn't detect a lot of echovirus, uh, 11 cases, only four mild cases, but only in this year until now, we have detected from a lot of laboratories perspective, uh, 183 non-severe cases, and also 10 severe cases just in, uh, in nine months. So that's really an increased circulation. It's a new outbreak to us. We haven't seen such an echo virus outbreak for the past 16 years. So for a lot of the physicians in Taiwan, including me, I'm, we are not familiar with uh, the, the name of echo virus, and we have to learn what's the difference between echo virus and enteral, other enteroviruses. So if you look at the epidemic and the epidemiology characteristics, uh, starting in April, we have started to see uh, at least four outbreaks in neonatal care facilities. So this echovirus has a preference for newborn babies. So the first outbreak occurred in a neonatal ward in hospital in northern Taiwan uh, in late April, with three cases, uh, no severe case. And later on in eastern Taiwan, in a neonatal intermediate care unit in early May, four cases and one severe case. And later on, south southern Taiwan, in a postpartum care center. When we say postpartum care center, that's a cultural practice in Taiwan. Uh, after birth, usually uh, the mother uh, should receive a one month rest. And usually, the one month rest in the past was conducted in the household. But because of the changing culture, more and more families are uh, likely to send the uh, mother post delivery to a postpartum care center for better care. But that also leads to an opportunity for those mothers and children to mix together in a single facility. So the first postpartum care center echovirus outbreak this year uh, resulted in seven uh, newborn cases. Later on, we are also seeing a, another neonatal ward outbreak in mid May. And uh, uh, just during the three months from May to July, in total, we have identified 10 uh, antivirus severe cases caused by echovirus 11, including seven deaths. And if you look at their age distribution, you'll see 50% uh, of these severe cases occurred uh, within seven days of birth. And all these very, very uh, small newborn baby they passed away, unfortunately, because of echovirus eleven. And for a little bit older newborn, the fatality rate is a little bit lower, and it was zero uh, when the babies were more than 14 years, old, 14 days uh, old. So the 14 days old are also actually 
a two-year-old male and also a four-year-old female. So this is an outbreak that very much attacked newborn uh, preferentially in Taiwan. So this is a new lesson learned because in newborn we don't expect to see her vagina or her mouse disease. So how do you detect these cases? You have to identify the newborn uh, safety syndrome. And also these newborns, they were infected mostly from their mother. However, we don't expect to see a lot of symptoms associated with Echovirus 11 in pregnant mother. So the challenges were how to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Um, and in the neonatal care systems, there were also some debates. Uh, in their practice, they uh, like to use alcohol-based hand hygiene. However, we, we know that alcohol may not be uh, good enough if the concentration is not uh, high enough to kill antivirus. So the debate was how to integrate soap and water and hygiene into the system. And also there was some concerns about reducing the glove, glove change between clients because the glove can also transmit the virus to other uh, babies. And also we, uh, if after the outbreak, we enforce the hand hygiene before and after wearing gloves to make sure they are not uh, contaminated uh, by their hands of the virus into the glove and transmit the virus uh, over the glove. The disinfection practices in these facilities were inspected and there were some breaches, so we required the facilities to implement a frequent and appropriate disinfection on a daily basis. Another big debate is the so-called family-centered nursing. Uh, in Mandarin Chinese, we say wing tong shi. This is room in, so to allow baby and the mother to be in the same room for uh, strengthening the mother-child uh, uh, emotional relationship, but that also can lead to opportunities of virus transmission. So uh, the practice has been blamed uh, partly for causing the outbreak, so uh, after discussing with related authorities, uh, they agreed to uh, relax uh, the requirement of uh, the practice of family center nursing uh, during the antivirus season. Still, the challenges are uh, generally we don't expect mother to have a lot of symptoms. Also, in this outbreak, we rarely see uh, mothers of infected newborn cases exhibit any uh, symptoms. So how to properly screen or to identify uh, at least mother to prevent mother-to-child transmission still doesn't have any good practical recommendations. However, because of the outbreak, we have involved a new partner like the OPS GIN Society in order to uh, put out uh, the alert to the gynecologists and obstetricians and also they are better in a better role to communicate with pregnant mothers about how to avoid unnecessary social contact in order for them to stay away from antivirus during the outbreak. So in conclusion, I'd like to just highlight after 20 years of the H71 outbreak, in Taiwan now we have a robust surveillance system to detect early about uh, possible antivirus outbreaks and also increased antivirus activity not only for A71 but also for other antiviruses. So for now severe cases we track that. Also recently we added antivirus testing into the FP and the ARI surveillance. The system was flexible enough in response to events so we can change for example reporting criteria because of the new disease pattern. And I want to also highlight that in Taiwan, the public awareness for antivirus was pretty much heightened. I would say sometimes unnecessary fear about the antivirus. It's a good driver of cooperating with the government, but sometimes also uh, unnecessary panic caused by increased antivirus activity. So it's a, 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 like a double sword. But still, it triggered a lot of social participation to assist for example, in our hand washing campaign, and also a lot of the stakeholders like Ministry of Education uh, and the, the uh, child care facilities, they are very willing to engage in uh, related activities in order to reduce antivirus spread in the community. 20 years ago, we thank to the astute positions for reminding and reporting uh, antivirus A71 to us. 
Still, after 20 years, they are still very, very critical and important. They are key informants to tell us about uh, the disease severity uh, in, in response to a certain antivirus uh, serotype, and also the clinical spectrum in terms of the newer antivirus strain. For example, the echovirus 11, we see a lot of neonatal cases. EBT68, we saw a lot of uh, AFP cases. We talked to uh, the physician, professors, and uh, consulted them about uh, how to manage uh, clinically and also what kind of public health response can assist in uh, clinical, uh, clinical management. And also we rely on these uh, physicians to, uh, uh, to jump into the training network as experts in order for new doctors to learn more about antivirus and reduce associated mortality of the children. Still, the challenges with current strategy is uh, without a, the availability of massive vaccination program, it's not able to, uh, for us to eliminate antivirus 71. Still, it's controllable and the mortality has reduced, but we hope that uh, research on vaccination and other control strategies can help us further reduce the spread of antivirus 871. And we are also in face of the emerging threat of other non A71 antiviruses, such as D68 and the uh, uh, antivirus. So I think continual research and surveillance are still necessary. And that finished my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.